Well, hello everyone. I hope you can hear us. Um, my name is Mason Funk, and I am the founder and executive director of a project called the Outwards Archive, or Outwards for short. Uh, the Outwards Archive has a very simple mission, which is to travel the United States in person or at present moment virtually and record interviews with the pioneers and the elders of the LGBTQ uh, civil rights movement. We've been in existence for about four years. And in that time, we've recorded about 150 interviews in 26 states. We're based in Los Angeles. And I wanna say that the Outwards offices are situated on land that originally owned and continues to be owned by the Tongva indigenous per, uh, tribe. And um, we want to acknowledge that fact at the outset. When we began production in Outwards, uh, for Outwards, back in 2016, one of the things I was very, very clear on was that if we're going to use the acronym LGBT or LGBTQ, that every single one of the letters in that acronym should be well represented. But as probably many, if not all of you know, the bisexual community within the LGBTQ community or the lesbian and gay community back in the day has not always been welcome, has not always been invited to participate, has not always had equal representation for their lives and experiences. So from day one, I was convinced and determined that Outwards should not replicate that mistake. Early on, I was connected to the people on this webinar and to some other bisexual activists and elders around the country who very graciously and generously agreed to share their stories with Outwards. And this event, our first ever uh, public facing event dedicated specifically to bisexual voices is a direct outgrowth of these individuals' generosity uh, with Outwards and with their lives. Uh, if you want to learn more about Outwards, please do visit our website, which is theoutwardsarchive.org. You'll see it on your screen there, theoutwardsarchive.org. And don't forget to spell the word words with an O and not an A. And without any further ado, I want to introduce Lorraine Hutchins. She was one of those people who we interviewed back in the summer of 2016. She and I recently exchanged an email where she said that in that interview, we were simultaneously schooling each other, but I really feel like she was schooling me more than I was schooling her. And I learned a tremendous amount. We interviewed her and A. Billy Jones Tennant on the same day. We previously had interviewed Lani Kahomano in California, subsequently Robin Oaks, and then a couple years later, we were able to record the story of Luigi Ferrer. But in the first place, I wanna introduce Lorraine. I'm gonna disappear, I'm gonna go away and leave you all in the capable hands of Ray McCarthy, our highly valued team member who's gonna be behind the curtain, manipulating the levers and making sure everything that runs smoothly. I just wanna say thank you again to our panelists for, for participating. Thank you to all of you in the audience for joining. I hope you have an amazing experience and please reach out to us at the Outwards Archive, info at theoutwardsarchive.org. Have a great evening and thank you. I've been teaching for 10 years. When I started teaching 10 years ago, I definitely felt more resistance and more hostility in the classroom, in the undergraduate classroom, to gay issues in general. A lot of people at my campus didn't even know what LGBT meant as an acronym. About two, three, five years ago at the most, I noticed a relaxation and a shift in my classrooms with people being less homophobic, not everybody, people being more generous and open. And I'm talking people from all over the world. My classroom is um, people from Ethiopia and Senegal and uh, Malaysia and um, Ecuador, um, all in the same classroom. I'm not saying that there's not a lot of resistance and fear and misunderstanding and homophobia and uh, fear of women's power all there, there certainly is. And I feel it's changing. I do feel whether we would call it the bi tribe or uh, whatever we would call it, um, I do feel that people's understanding and generous spirit about 
sexual diversity is growing. And that gives me hope. If I didn't go to class and teach, I would be somewhere hiding under the blankets, wailing, depressed, and just not feeling good. My students, the 18 year olds especially, give me hope. bisexuals, you people who love us and who support us, thank you, thank you for being here and helping us acknowledge that bisexuality is visible and that you see us, you hear us, and we are who we say we are. We're worth it and we're worthy of being recognized. Um, the bisexuals that you see here today are almost the ancestors and still alive. Some of the founders of the U.S. bisexual movement and of local bi groups. And we're people who put the B in LGBT. And we've worked together for many years on hurried phone consults about the latest stupid thing the New York Times or Newsweek said about bisexuals. And we've counseled each other over and over again about having patience and having hope and vision to keep on keeping on. I wanted to give a shout out today to somebody who can't be with us, and that is Cliff Arneson, who's recovering from surgery. Cliff wrote Coming Out to Congress in By Any Other Name, our book, and he was the first LGBT serviceman veteran to ever testify on Capitol Hill for the US Congress of the United States about veterans' rights, particularly LGBT veterans' rights. Also wanted to give a shout out to our people in the Midwest, colleagues who, rep who aren't represented here tonight, but who have inspired us and led us for many years with their Because Conference and BOP, the Bisexual Organizing Project, and much, much else. Bisexuals are the most numerous of LGB people, but you wouldn't know that, would you, given the cultural imagery and the kinds of discussions and dialogues that we usually have? I remember um, I invited my parents to a big bisexual conference at American University in 1993. 1993 was the third march on Washington for gay rights and the most representative democratic of the marches that ever happened. And the first march to include the B word in the title. We had a conference celebrating bisexuality that weekend of the march. And I invited my parents to hear me keynote um, because I wanted them to see what 500 bisexuals in a room look like, just like them, just like everybody else, who knew? Um, that only bisexual to speak at that march the next day was Lani Kahumana, my co-editor and co-conspirator, and she introduced me and my parents in that auditorium that day. Um, I think where, as far as my cultural roots and my identifying with Japanese people, Hawaiian people. I always have, I have, a, I've always had a very proud, fierce uh, connection with the culture. And um, on the other hand, coming out as bisexual, my, my internalized biphobia was just, I'm not like that. When I, I was an out lesbian, I fell in love with a man, whoops, in 1980, that's a pretty big thing. And I, I, I couldn't even say I was bisexual. I said lesbian identified bisexual so quick because I just couldn't say bisexual by myself. I had to prove that I, you know, I wasn't a traitor. I didn't want to be kicked out. It was my community. But the internalized biphobia was enormous. It took years, it really did to kind of like, I'm not a swinger. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not into three ways. I, whatever, whatever stereotype I had in my head, I had to live through every single one of them. And as I met more people, as I talked about it, I thought, oh, well, no wonder I had to say lesbian identified bisexual. I was so biphobic, I couldn't do it. But there I was in love with a man. Well, it, I was truly in love with this person and how could that be wrong? People give me hope, especially the young ones, especially the old ones and everybody in between. And Lonnie, who's my elder, um, 
I didn't go to San Francisco to meet you. I met you when I came to San Francisco. And many years later, we talked about um, you being the political architect of the bi movement. What did we mean by political architect? Well, you're always watching and thinking and wondering how we can be more out and how we can be more open and more effective as bisexual people in the world. That's basically it. And you've collected an incredible archive on bi history and bi interviews and stories in the past few years, way after we edited it by, by any other name. You're someone who's taught me a lot about having the courage to speak out. And you've been a wonderful writing, editing partner back then and um, over the last 30 years. And we're still friends and our friendship is still very precious to me. I can't introduce you. I want you to introduce yourself. This is my first Zoom. Uh, right, <laughs> right now I uh, live rurally. Uh, my connectivity is low. I live in North California. I'm an evacuee, fire evacuee, and I'm at my daughter's right now in Oakland. Where I live, I'm the only out bisexual I know. I've been out the whole time. Um, I stepped away from activism about a decade ago and shifted my focus to uh, my family, um, which is a really big, a big deal to me. My family means a lot and my activism pulled me away from my family and it's come full circle and it's, uh, it's really, really wonderful. Um, I'm currently immersed in my 80s and 90s archives. There's like uh, 15 tubs of papers and that was before email. So a lot of it is snail mail back and forth letters, including with Robin, including with Luigi. Maybe not so much with A. Billy because I met you more in the 90s and Lorraine and I back and forth. So there's a lot of incredible stuff that I'm enjoying and that um, I'm tracking right now and writing about how we arrived at the national table in the 90s. Mm. And I love that. And um, as far as where my heart, my politics are right now is I'm Kanaka Maoli and I stand with the Hawaiian sovereignty movement and I'm doing a lot of work on that. And I just want to give a special um, recognition of our ancestor visionary activist, David Laurier and Alan Rockway and Stephen Donaldson and Brenda Howard and Ibrahim Farajaje. And a special shout out to my darling 13 year old granddaughter who's on the on this call or Zoom, whatever it is. She was educating me a little bit. And also to Maggie Rubenstein who came out as a bisexual activist in 1969 and she will be 90 years old in three days. Hi, I'm here, I made it. Yay. Okay. So um, we all have a lot to say and we're going to keep it packed and nice, right? But the next person I want you to meet is Luigi. He's a bio organizer now from Miami, um, also from Puerto Rico and Boston and a lot of places in between. Um, Luigi is somebody who I, messed it, met, who I met after you tested positive for HIV. And you're somebody I met who I was afraid you were dying in the 90s when we were working together on national bi efforts. But somehow you surprised me and you became a survivor who's still alive and thriving and hanging in there. And you've become a national authority on HIV prevention and treatment, administration at the grassroots and at the federal levels. You still work in the field many years later and you're still teaching, you're still caring and I'm so glad. I was at the University of Miami Marine Lab out on Virginia Key. There was a, a little ad in the back of the New Times, our city paper here, that said bisexual support group had a phone number and had a time and a date. And I looked at that ad for months. Um, and it wasn't until my girlfriend at the time said, hey, you want to go to this meeting? That I said, okay, let's call. It still took us about a month to show up at the meeting. But when we did, we found a group of other young people that were also questioning their sexuality and wanting to learn more. I think just having, again, a peer group uh, that you can talk to, that you can bounce ideas off of, that you can socialize with. We know that all of that contributes to um, 
good mental health outcomes. Um, we know it keeps um, young people safe. Um, it prevents suicide if, and depression when young people have somebody that they can talk to. I think the most vivid or stark um, memory or incidents of biphobia that I've faced was meeting someone through the personals in the paper back then, because we didn't have online dating yet. And being out on a first date, we went to a nice Thai restaurant, took our shoes off and sat down at a little table. Um, and we had just ordered and we're talking. And I said that I was bisexual because it wasn't, you know, anything that I was embarrassed about. And this guy just got up and left. He didn't say a word. He just got up and left. So I finished the meal, paid, and as I'm walking out, the waitress says, oh, oh, are these your shoes? He had left his, he was in such a panic and such a hurry to get out of there that he had left his shoes. I feel like I'm part of the lost generation. Um, my cohort of gay and bisexual men are mostly dead, decimated by the HIV epidemic. Um, I don't know how I made it this far, how I managed to survive, um, but it beats the alternative. <laughs> um, I'm glad that I'm here and that I'm still able to make a contribution. I do feel a responsibility to make a contribution, um, to tell the stories of people that are no longer here with us. Okay, I want to say we have two more panelists and then we're going to be talking amongst each other. And we have a lot of questions that we came up with, but we decided we don't care about the questions except for using them as touchstones. So I want to now um, tell you a little bit about Robin Oaks. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her and then Ray will play the clip. Um, Robin is someone who's a tiny bit younger than me who still gets called the grandmother of the bi movement because she's so wise, warm, supportive. She's a thought leader and a cheerleader for us all. And Robin has that enthusiasm that blows people away. Um, what do you mean you're still teaching about bisexual identities, Robin, after all these years? What do you mean you travel around campuses and colleges all over the country, all over the world as bisexual ambassador and bisexual instructor? What do you mean, Robin? How do you keep the faith? <laughs> keep supporting bi women. Organizing is what you do. You keep on doing resource projects. You have an indomitable spirit. Um, let's look at the clip from Robin. five-year period between coming to be certain that I was bisexual and actually saying it out loud to other people was a really hard time. Looking back, I was profoundly uncomfortable. I think I engaged in some coping mechanisms that were probably not too healthy. Or I think I had an eating disorder back then. I definitely drank too much when I was in college. I smoked cigarettes. It was a horrible time. Carrying that feeling that there was this information about you that was so unpalatable that if you told anyone else who you were, they would no longer want to be your friend. To carry that feeling, even if it wasn't a rational feeling, is, is so horrible. It's a horrible thing. There's all kinds of data that shows that people who identify as bisexual have very high rates of minority stress and that in many areas, it's actually higher than lesbians or gay men. Bisexuals have higher rates of suicidality than lesbians or gay men. They have higher rates of um, intimate partner violence. And so for me, the data is very disturbing and it points out how important it is to not just look at LGBTQ youth as though they were one uniform mass. You know, trans youth also have a lot of health disparities and bisexual youth have a lot of health disparities. And that's partly why I'm an activist now. I don't want anyone else to have to go through what, you know, what I went through. My moderator hat on, I want to say the last 15 minutes of this will be devoted to Q&A. If you put it in the Q&A, um, Ray is monitoring the Q&A box. So we will have time with that. Questions from people who are watching. Okay. 
We have one more person here, a Billy Jones Hennon, my Washington DC friend who charmed me as a bi man when I first met him back in the 70s when he was a dad and a husband organizing gay married men back in that good old time when gay married man meant one thing only, a man attracted to men in a marriage with a woman. As now, it can also mean a man married to another man. So what's a gay married man? Billy is the kind of person who's so familiar with going back and forth to the White House, even before Obama, but definitely during the Obama time, that the staff there, you know, he was familiar with them. They recognized him um, when we went to the White House um, in Obama's time. But also, Billy um, helped organize one of the first people of color contingents, the first to ever go to the White House during the Carter era. And that was around 1979 when Billy was part of organizing the very first March on Washington for gay and lesbian rights. And Billy's somebody, every group he's organized in, he stands up and he says, what about the bisexuals? What about transgender? What about other people that aren't being included? Let's talk about including everyone. Um, Billy's a great granddad and a wonderful friend. And let's see the Billy clip. Saying you're bisexual can mean so many different things. It doesn't mean the same thing to everyone. You know, sometimes people interpret that if I say I'm bisexual, then I must be in three ways. Or they, um, or you say you're bisexual, but you're in a relationship with a man. Well, the truth is I could have easily chosen to define myself as gay but I'm choosing not to. And I think we live in a world that I think it says you have to choose, and it doesn't allow you to be fluid. It doesn't allow you to love people regardless of the gender. It's the person as a whole person that I have the capacity to love. The biggest commitment that I have right now to myself is that I will not lie or deny that I'm bisexual. Let's say if I'm invited someplace or if I have a chance to speak and it's an appropriate audience and I identify myself as bisexual, invariably some youth will come to me and say, thank you. I identify as bisexual too. And not necessarily a youth, but especially a youth. I'm often thanked, but quietly. So that person is still not quite strong enough to come out, but they are grateful that somebody did. Can we take a moment and all like exhale and inhale a little bit and just kind of like ground into the space of out visibility of bias? We are by, we are seen and we are heard. Anybody want to say anything of us? If you don't, you know, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll start. Okay. I, I just want to say it's, it's so nice to see you all <laughs> and to be able to spend some time together because we all have busy lives. We're all working in our communities and we don't often get a time to come together. And it really warms my heart looking and seeing, you know, that we've got 76 people online with us and um, that we can share, um, you know, what's in our hearts, what's in our thoughts. These have been really difficult times. Um, you know, COVID has hit our community very hard Miami, where I live, has been, and all of Florida has been really impacted. And these are lonely times where we're getting used to new ways of interacting with people on Zoom and, and doing board meetings and doing work meetings online. And so it's just so good that um, we can do a little by organizing and a little um, community building online. Uh, one of the things I, I am noticing, uh, I, since returning to Washington, I've become heavily involved with uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, the local group. 
And one of the things that I noticed that is different uh, today versus my civil rights era in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, here, now, I can be as out as I wish to be. Uh, and saying that I'm bisexual is seems to be not a big thing with anyone or uh, anyone saying that they're gay or lesbian or transgender is not an issue in the Black Lives Matter movement, wherein in the civil rights movement, I had to, well, I did hide for my sexuality. I mean, I didn't dare come out as a, uh, a gay person. Uh, I was involved briefly in Oakland with the Black Panthers and I, there was discussion about gay issues, but uh, people did not particularly come out per se. Uh, you were encouraged to, that was a, a non-issue. And now I think people recognize that a blending of these issues and especially today is really screwed up day uh, with the outcome of Brianna's uh, issue. Um, it's very compelling, very telling. Um, and, and, you know, it, it reminds me that as much as we think the progress we feel that we have made as in within the LGBTQ community, we take two steps forward, but then we are always taking one step back. And we have to keep our eyes on the prize. We can't just say, okay, we've won, we've gotten there. It's an ongoing struggle because if you don't keep your eyes on the prize, it gets taken away from you really easily. And I think, I feel like that's what we're going through. And with, as bisexuals, we have to deal with the biphobia and negativeness within the LGBTQ community as much as we do outside of our community. So it's a tough struggle. And for myself, you know, I have multiple identities, you know, as West Indian, as African American, uh, you know, as bisexual, uh, as a parent, a grandfather, a great grandfather. It's, it's a lot of identities, a lot of struggles. And some days uh, my bisexuality is my center, my core. But on another day, that may not be the core of who I am. It may be my identity as a black person that becomes a core. So, and I, I know that all of us here uh, on this panel have multiple identities and multiple cores and multiple struggles. And I, I remember once uh, an activist, bless his heart, um, used to yell and scream that it was, it's gay, gay, gay. I mean, the feeling was you had to be single, single focus. And I guess for that person, privilege, since he was so privileged in, in a sense, he could say that. But I know for people of color, we were like, no, <laughs> you know, I, I can't be single focus. And I think I, I know that that's the issue for us as bisexual. We can't be single focused. We, you know, it's a it's dual struggles. Does anybody feel called to say something? Is that a look on Robin's face? I'm I don't always know. called to say mm -hmm. something. <laughs> I just wanted to, everything you said, Billy, is really, really important. And when I hear people say, oh, why should we be talking about race in the LGBTQ movement? Or why should we be talking about anything in some other movement? We are interconnected. Like none of most, you know, some of us are only, only hold one identity that carries oppression, but I would say probably most of us in some way or other carry multiple identities that carry oppression. And that's something that we, we, can't, we can't separate movements into separate 
silos. They have to be interconnected and we have to always look at the bigger picture. Because I also think that as someone who loves sociology, that you have to understand that some of these things that happen, even though they show up in very different ways, you know, as they impact different people, the, the dynamic behind them is so similar. Like there are certain dynamics that are similar and that undergird oppression in general, you know, even as it plays out in very specific ways on different people. But just, just like that, that bigger picture is so important. So thank you, Billy, A. Billy, for saying that. And I also just wanted to say that for me to be on this, in this space with all of these biconic and amazing humans is like brain, brain exploding. I've known all of you for 30 years and maybe a little bit more for a couple of you. And there are also a whole bunch of people listening to this Zoom right now who have also been around for at least that long. So this is, this is, my, it's the best I usually way to, am not without words, but I am without words right now. Lonnie. I would just say it's the best way to celebrate Bisexuality Day. It's like, what a gift this whole, all of, just seeing our faces and hearing the voices again is such a, it's wonderful. I, and I think this call has scooped up people who we've known and worked with for years and people who are new to us who maybe this is the first time they've seen this many bisexuals out on a screen and maybe they don't know what a bi movement would be or is, a, is there a bi movement or is the bi movement a thing of the past as Luigi said um, when we were preparing for this. There's so many amazing like three generations down now that are activists and organizers. And when I get an email or even a phone call sometimes from people calling to ask me things, I am so heartened and so excited. And just like, I just step right into my organizer activist self and become the cheerleader. And um, I just have to say, that's what gives me, like Lorraine said in her, in her outwards, is that there's so much, I'm so inspired by what's going on now and thankful too. You know, one of the things that made me most thankful was the White House um, gatherings that we had during the Obama era because they weren't just pride gatherings, which other presidents had done, but they were also focused on federal officials and policy making and information and research sharing. And it's the first time that I felt, oh my God, this many people are at risk of domestic violence and suicidal depressed feelings. and it's horrible, but at least we have the data and we can mobilize people's understanding about how to respond to that data. Um. Well, work meetings, um, we really, I, I felt like we, for once, we were pushing the agenda where we needed to. For those of you who don't know, we had a series of meetings at the White House during the Obama administration. Um, I think there were three big meetings. And then we actually had a fourth meeting about um, asylum, about bisexual identified asylum seekers with a smaller group of people. And just that it was amazing because we actually got a chance to talk to, you know, administration officials about policy and, and how policy impacts specifically by plus people. And it was, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing to be there. It was amazing. To be plus, Robin? There. Tell but, us about my plus. I plus is a term that is used that I use to describe um, all of the various different words that people who have the potential to be attracted to more than one gender um, might choose to use for themselves. So bisexual, pansexual, queer, fluid, et cetera. And the plus in bi plus, as I use it, is intended to value and recognize that there are many different labels and that every single one of them is important. And and every single one of those labels is the best label for some people. I think one of the, I feel that one of the things that we still need to work on as a movement is getting uh, bisexuals to be more out, more vocal, more visible. Mm. Uh, we know from data uh, that bisexuals outnumber the gays, gay men, and lesbians. And we say that, but un unfortunately, we don't have many persons uh, openly 
acknowledging that. Uh, I know I struggle with having to, the fact that I am in a same gender loving relationship and have been now for 43 years, people still want to bestow the label of gay upon me. They still want to, they see me as a gay man. And even though both my, both myself and my partner identify ourselves as bisexual, they just don't get it. <laughs> they just don't understand it. Um, so I do feel that, you know, one of the challenges we have before us is to, if, if we outnumber the gay men and lesbians, then we, we should have far more voices speaking up and identifying themselves. Uh, I was very moved by, uh, okay, um, Gillen, I think his name is, from Florida. Uh, unfortunate, the circumstance in which he had, but he was very clear of saying, I do not identify myself as a gay man, I identify myself as bisexual. And he said it very forceful, very powerful, and was very clear, and with a wife who was really supportive of him. I, I was very impressed with her and pretty much say, you know, our relationship is personal, it's private, and what we have together is ours. And pretty much telling people to stay out of it. <laughs> we do have more people coming out publicly, um, some of whom were elected public officials or ran for office like he did in Florida. But we also need a lot more. Yeah. So it's scary being out and by, and we can do it. We've done it, and we're still alive. I'm just looking at the time. We still have a lot of time left um, to talk amongst ourselves. What have we not said that might be important to say before we go to the questions? I'm looking at the chat questions as well, but I'm seeing that there's a bunch of questions that are piling up that we could answer. But before we get to the questions, what have we not said that's important? Luigi, Lani? I remember a conversation with Mike Page, who was the creator of the Bi Flag. Um, and um, we were sort of musing about, you know, how come we don't have more people at our events? How come we don't have, and, you know, he was saying that apart from our sexuality, very often bi people don't have a lot, bi plus people don't have a lot in common with each other. You know, we come from all sorts of different social strata. We have people that are ultra liberal and people that are very conservative. Um, so we really, it, it's so diverse and it, it seems something odd to come together to find support around our sexuality and the fact I guess it's it's that oppression, that misunderstanding that some people uh, have when you say you're bisexual. It's like whoa, you know, um, greedy, untrustworthy, all all those misconceptions, all those stereotypes, right, that come out. Lonnie mentioned some of them before. Uh, all that internalized biphobia um, makes it really difficult, I think, to do organizing bi pan fluid organizing um and and so um it's it's been very interesting trying to work with younger people i i do a lot of speaking at colleges as well um doing hiv std prevention and safer sex um education and in in doing that work with young people they are hungry for the information that we have to offer um you know, in um, the jurisdiction that has the highest HIV rate in the country, um, Miami, Florida, um, there is no sex education in our high schools, right? So um, it's, it's, it's really sometimes very difficult to do this work. I feel like a lot of what we're doing is remedial education and there is no 
organized way, no systematic way to provide the education that kids need to protect themselves, to, you know, make better decisions, right? It's not that if they have all the information, all the right information, they're going to make the decisions that we want them to, but without that very basic information about human sexuality and um, how different STIs are transmitted, they can't make good decisions for themselves. You know, it's scary to be out and by, and yet it's still possible. And the more people that do it, the stronger it is to be comfortable to do it. And every, oh. single, t every oh. single time someone comes out as bi, they're serving as a possibility model for a lot of other people. That's right. I was living rurally, um, meaning uh, there's not a house really near me. We meet on the Sunday farmer's market, that kind of thing. Um, and I'm out everywhere, everywhere. And I just keep waiting for the moment when somebody says, oh, I am too. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet, but it's a big so what? That's what's really amazing to me to be, it's, it's Northern California, okay? So that's a little different, but still it's like, oh, really? You know, it's like, and? So um, we have done a lot of work to make that possible, at least in Northern California. And um, the youth are building on everything we did and we keep doing. I came out to my barber today. <laughs> <laughs> How was that? Well, I went to get a haircut because of course we have to look gorgeous, you know. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I went to get a haircut, and uh, I had said I had an event, and I, I really needed to get a haircut, and he kept pressing me as to what the event was, and I, I finally just said, well, today is by awareness, by celebration day, and, you know, I'm on a panel, and, and, he, and he got really interested in the conversation, and, uh, you know, <laughs> it wasn't my intent to come out to him, but there we were. And he, he revealed that his girlfriend that he'd been living with for four years is now in love with a, a woman. So <laughs> he's trying to figure out what to do about that. And I was like, nah, maybe you should explore also. <laughs> 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 oh, dear. Hey, Ray, you want to go to the questions or you want to keep, or all you guys want to keep talking? What do you think? One, one other point I think is important to make. Uh, we talk about uh, sexuality being fluid. And, you know, when I first uh, started talking about my sexuality, I remember that we used to talk about your between the ages of two and five, your, your sexuality was determined. And how we have evolved from that now saying that our sexuality, that we can be very fluid in terms of how we view ourselves as opposed to being fixed. Uh, and I think that's an important factor, especially for us as bisexuals to recognize that we can be fluid in terms of our attraction to uh, not just one gender, but across the board. Um, and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that to change over our lifetimes. Yeah. Yes, over a lifetime. I mean, you know, I could find myself, I, I mean, I, I'm clearly in, I'm in a committed relationship, but if heavens forbid something did happen to my partner and he, uh, I could see myself in a relationship with Robin. <laughs> and if anything happened to my wife, I could see myself in a relationship with you, a Billy. So there you have it. So there it is. We have proposed online. <laughs> it's on record. <laughs> 
I have proposed to one, two, three. Oh, Luigi, did I leave you out? Okay, I propose to you too. <laughs> He's got a smile on his face. I see. Oh. Maybe we should respond to the questions, yes? We've got a lot of questions. There are many questions. I don't know if we're going to get to all of them. Well, you get, you're the queen of questions. You get to decide. Fantastic, okay. Uh, well, since multiple people have asked this, um, the, and I also want to say, like, if, if I bring in a question and you're, you're not, if you're all not feeling it, like, we can move on to the next question. Um, but uh, multiple people have asked, like, what does being bisexual mean to each of you? Which mm. I know is a very broad question. Mm. Mm. I, I, my response would be being bisexual means that I have the capacity uh, to love uh, across gender line. Um, it means I can be att attractive, uh, romantic, uh, emotionally, physically, with men and or women or trans persons. Um, so it's an openness for me as opposed to being uh, deciding that it has to be a specific way I'm, I'm open. For me, it's, it, uh, it's got everything. To, well, now I go to say something. I say, well, it's about love. I just want to say it's about love, loving myself and putting my, uh, having my heart open to the chemistry, whatever that, whoever that other energy is. It's like there's a chemistry that happens and it doesn't matter to me uh, what gender at all. Yeah, yeah in, the, in the South Florida Bisexual Network support groups uh, that we had here for many, many years, we talked about this a lot. And a lot of us would say that gender is not a filter that we use to define our relationships, right? That um, we are open to relationships with more than one gender, including transgender individuals. And as, some, as somebody said to me, it was Lamy that said to me first, but I've heard a lot of other people say it, it's not about the plumbing, it's about the electricity. <laughs> <laughs> is all over the internet but I'm actually right now Lonnie thinking about your um your poem that goes that ha includes I'm a free-range chicken don't fence me in fence I can cock-a-doodle do your do and lay with the best of your hens <laughs> and, um, but I think what, what I would um my definition of bisexuality is actually all over the internet and I, I'm really happy about that and my definition mm -hmm. is that I call myself bisexual because I acknowledge in myself the potential to be attracted romantically and or sexually to people of more than one gender, not necessarily at the same time, not necessarily in the same way, and not necessarily to the same degree. And that, that de definition is actually kind of a product of many conversations with many people over a long period of time. Many, many years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I wanna say, um, uh, one of the things that I like about your definition is, is that you say, I call myself bisexual, right? Because as A. Billy was saying, it's not for other people to decide who we are or how we yeah. able ourselves, right? Um, it's a personal individual and it should be for everybody. Everyone has the right to their own autonomy and, and to their own definition of who they are most, you know, internally and most intimately. It's identity, not you identity. Yeah. Ha ha ha, good one. <laughs> Came from a student. Another question, which is specifically for Lonnie, uh, Caitlin McCarthy, uh, no relation to me, uh, as far as I know, says, thank you to all of the wonderful bi-cons on this call. It means so much to me as a youngish bi-archivist. 
My question is for Lonnie. Are you planning to donate your papers to a queer archive? It will be an invaluable resource for Byte History. Yes, I, um, yes, the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, historical uh, archives and museum, uh, my, my work's going to go there. In San Francisco, the city of San Francisco is working with the Historical Society to have an actual building. So the archives, they're including memorabilia and everything, which I've got tubs of memorabilia. But uh, so there'll be display of the archives in an actual building for bisexuals um, in the city of San Francisco. So it's amazing. And um, they've been working on this for a while. So my archives will be going there as well as uh, BIPOL, the Bay Area Bisexual Network. Maggie Rubenstein's archives are already there. So um, yeah, <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, people have been after my archives. I have to finish my book, but I'm moving on that again. So that's good. Uh, people are cheering for you in the chat, Lonnie. Um, oh, thank you. People are very happy about this news. <laughs> um, Meridian Lowe asked, uh, in y'all's opinions, what is the most important thing that can be done by non-bi individuals to forward the bisexual movement and by LGBTQ organizations? Um, I want to answer that about the LGBT organizations first and say that I saw that Stephanie wrote that um, there was a major news item today, which is that Ray Carey is stepping down as director of the National wow. Gay and Lesbian Task Force and being replaced by an out by woman named Kiera. I can't remember Kiera's last name. I'm sorry, Kiera. But um, point is, is this going to be a bi woman who's really out and bi and speaking about bi issues? There's been a lot of bi people at LGBT national organizations right. that haven't spoken out. And I hope Kara will be different. Kara Johnson? I think it's Johnson. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing that people can do, whether you're bi or not, is speak about bi issues. And when you hear somebody say, gay, lesbian, transgender, interrupt them and say, hello. There's a B in there. It's bisexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. I still read that and hear it, and it really pisses me off. Yeah, but also not just a lexicon of LGBTQ. I mean, actually embracing bisexuals for the entirety of the of the yeah. the year. I mean, not just September twenty third. Oh, it's bisexual awareness day, and then. That's it, and well, we have we use the bi. We say LG, you know, bi. But you gotta. It's time to live it. It's time to embrace bisexuals uh, and identify the issues and speak out. And the organizations are in positions to make sure that those organizations that they team with are also uh, uh, embracing not only lesbians and gays, but also bisexual. And so for someone like me, uh, I need to work closer with uh, African American organizations like NAACP, or even the National Black Justice Coalition, which shamefully, I mean, that is that is the civil rights organization currently for uh, Black uh, LGBTQ people, but it doesn't even say it in its name, National Black Justice Coalition. What does that say to you in terms of, you know, sexual minorities? It, it's not even in its name, which is, <laughs> I find, appalling, but, you know. I, I could live with it if I felt like they were focused more around uh, the issues of LGBTQ people. And they have a clear mission and they do address our issues, um, but not strongly enough. And same thing with um, most black civil rights group organizations that exist. 
they limit themselves around what they were, are willing to address. And I think some of it is just that they don't have information. They don't have an understanding. They don't have enough of us bisexuals standing up uh, and insisting that the bi flag be ways that they, they do understand it. I want to say something about okay. sex, and that is, you know, an old uh, flyer that said, come on, you can say it, bisexual. <laughs> can everybody here say bisexual? You know, <laughs> can we say it out loud? Um, Lonnie could tell you, she was there that in the 1993 um, organizing um, meetings, there was a big fight about whether they could say LGB or T um, in the title of the march. And the compromise came out, defaulted to, well, you can call yourselves bi, but not bisexual, because that's too yeah. sexual. The people in the rural areas that were there, representing rural areas, the South, the Deep South, said, we can't take sexual back home. And we could <laughs> live with bi, but not the sexual. And it's sort of like, oh, right, and, <laughs> ah, funny. Um, but yeah, they could take the buy. So sexual was dropped, but this is a sexual liberation movement. But the reality of rural and South, Deep South, Midway, you know, it's, uh, that was their reality. So. Well, and, and I became a sex educator partly because I was trying to defend myself and explain myself. And I realized that it's about people's fear of sexuality and talking about intimacy and erotic energy. It's not about only those weird bisexuals. It's how can we teach people to be comfortable about intimacy, especially in COVID. You know, if we had another hour, we could talk about how COVID has changed us as bisexuals. I think those of us who are really comfortable with our sexuality and with sex education also need to be careful and con conscious of the fact that not everybody is that comfortable. Yeah. I remember a bi conference in San Francisco where we oh, yeah. performance that was a little edgy. We all loved it except the folks from South Carolina who were appalled and, you know, yeah. walked out and, and felt horrible. So we have to be sensitive for those of us who aren't as far along as we are. I, I also remember um, in my early days as an activist, you know, sticking my foot in my mouth many, many times, saying the wrong thing. And <laughs> sometimes I, I felt like, there was a, a, a very, like a lashback, you know, uh, it, was, it was very hard, but there were lots of other people that were also kind and would take me aside and say, this is what's going on and educated me. And that was very, very, most of you that are on here, you know, really helped me with that. Um, coming from um, a Latinx, you know, a, a very conservative Catholic background, um, you know, and, and coming from a very racist uh, society, you know, where, you know, we had been taught that, you know, white people were better than anybody else, you know, overcoming those messages, those tapes um, is a real challenge. And it's something that I continue um, to work on to this day. I understand that. Thank you. Thank you. you know, sometimes I think we're still back there <laughs> in the 50s and 60s and 70s, Billy. <laughs> I mean, I know yeah. things have changed. I know they've gotten better, but um, we, got a lot, we got a long way to go. Well, as someone who travels all over this country and, and in other parts of the world, I think that we're in so many different places. You know, different, different ones of us have, diff have had different opportunities to have access to information, um, to community. And so many of us have done this journey in isolation without the tools of, of having people to help us the way Luigi was describing. And I guess for me, that just reminds me that we're all 
we're all, you know, in some way or other having a hard time with this. We're all doing our best. Um, some of us are farther along. Like I am finally, and finally at age 61, I finally feel pretty comfortable, like 96% comfortable, maybe some days 97. And, but I just, you know, just to remember that, that for other people, it's not the same experience. Some people haven't had 44 years of practice the way I have. And that I just try to remember to not judge people and to understand that, you know, we yeah. just need to help each other along. We're all having a hard time and we all need to just pull for and with each other. And if we can do that, and if we can operate from a place of love, which I think everyone on this panel, I've seen you in action, like you operate from a place of love, from a place of openness. You know, that's just a, such a great and powerful way to counterbalance all the pain and hurt and fear and terror and isolation that's out there. So I think that you know, anyone who's watching this, like just take that love that you have and, and send it back out to other people who need it. Mm -hmm. So do we leave them hungry or do we ask another question? <laughs> I, I feel like my, many people have now asked some variation on what's next for Vi Plus organizing yes. in the, yes. the Vi community. Um, so we can make at least like four people happy with one, uh, with one question if we uh, answer that before we take off. You know, I have no answer for that other than surviving and keeping on. So help me out, guys. Mm. Mm. So, um, as someone who's 62 now, <laughs> I'm sort of thinking, what does the, um, you know, future have in stall for me? Um, what is my retirement? I, I have no family. Uh, I, you know, I, I live with um, three roommates. Um, there are four of us in the house. Three of us are HIV positive. We've built our own community to support each other here, but how do we um, perhaps amplify this or, or replicate this for other people? Um, what's gonna happen when I'm 70 some? Um, I finally, you know, figured out my retirement and have a job and, you know, so that part is taken care of. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty. And one question that, that, you know, sort of is back there is like, so now partly because of COVID, but even before COVID, you know, things were sort of slowing down in terms of my sexual life. Can I still call myself bisexual if I'm not having sex? <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Good grief. What was the question again? What do we see <laughs> happening for the bi movement in the future? Or want to happen. Or want to happen. The dream, the vision. I think now we can, oh, go ahead, Luigi. I, I, I was gonna say, I think it's not up to me to determine the future of the bisexual movement. It's up to people that are in their 20s and, and 30s and people that are in college and and it's up to them to define what type of movement they want. When I was in my 20s, I had a very active group of friends and uh, we supported each other and we organized tons of conferences. You know, I missed on having an annual bisexual conference and that used to happen. So it can happen again if people want it. I don't think that we should be creating stuff just to create stuff. It has to be something that people want. So here's one thing that I'd like to see in the future. I think that, I mean, Billy, you mentioned that in some ways we're, we haven't, things haven't changed nearly enough. And in some ways they've changed a lot. I think that the work we've been doing for all these decades needs to continue. And it yes. needs to be done by many, many more people. And I think that's, that's one of the things I see. The other thing I see is one of the dynamics that I've come across in my activist work and in my campus work especially is that some people try to put bisexual and pansexual in competition with one another. Uh, um, like yeah. when, I, when I ask people, are you familiar with the bisexual versus pansexual debate? People just 
look traumatized and they, they just like cringe and they're like, yes, because I think it causes a tremendous amount of pain and damage. And what I would say to all of us is every one of these identities is beautiful. Every non-binary sexuality is absolutely beautiful and wonderful. And what if instead of fighting over which one word everyone should use, what if we took all of that amazing energy and turned it to holding space for mm. all non-binary sexualities? Like what if we did that? instead of trying to fight over that little slice of pie, like that's my slice, no, that's my slice. Like, let's just start building, like baking some more pie so that there's enough for everybody. Cause I think that when we operate out of a frame of scarcity, it does not make us stronger. If we operate out of a space of like demanding abundance, yeah, then we, then we can be powerful and then we can change the world. But there, I think that there's so much pain and so many of us have felt that we haven't been listened to. And I think that's what leads us to do this. There's an expression, hurt people, hurt people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just think we need to be aware of that dynamic and try not to play that game because it doesn't help us. And pulling together, like, yay, pan people, yay, bi people, yay, queer people, yay, all of us. And by the way, I identify as bi and pan and queer, and I don't see any, um, I'm not fighting with myself anyway, but just, just like, they're all beautiful labels and each of them is the best label for some people. So just let's take that energy and pull together and, and hold on to that space that we so desperately need. I think too, we need to listen to each other. I think as light skinned people, people with privilege and we have, every one of us has privilege in one way or another. And I think we listening to each other, just being quiet and listening, not getting defensive, take the information in um, is really important right now. There's so much confusion and so much chaos in the world. And uh, it's easy to just get spinning, just start to spin out. But if we slow down and really listen to each other and uh, if you understand or somebody's telling me, me in particular, you have you have privilege in this situation. I need to back away and listen and hear that deeply, listen deeply. And um, that's the way we move forward because there's so many people silent and silent that when people speak up, it's really important to listen. Just, just do it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Lorraine and Avili, do you have anything you want to say on this question or, or should we leave with that beautiful note from Lonnie? I have nothing more to add to the response to that question. I'm ready for the next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have anything more to say except we need to feed the love, not the fear hmm. in our whole country, in our whole world. The universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, we'll do, we'll do one last question. Um, and I'm, uh, for those whose questions weren't able to be answered, I'm sorry, there are so many questions and I'm sure we could sit here and have an amazing conversation all night. Uh, and also Zoom fatigue is a real thing. And so we're, we're going to uh -huh. keep this shorter. Um, but since, you know, um, some people ask like, what are some of the most important lessons you've learned through your organizing or um, what uh, some of the big milestones of the past four years have been. Um, so I feel like maybe an umbrella question that could encompass some of those is like what you're, what you're proud of from your organizing and, and uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there. What you're proud of. Hmm. Well, I'll answer it and then I'll shut up. <laughs> um, I um, really value my community of faith. And I think that too often queer folk abandon the moral high ground and don't identify as people of faith for one reason or another. Perhaps hadn't, they haven't found the right fit. Um, I remember at a Southeast, uh, bisexual regional conference, I kept on seeing 
all these very cool people that had this little chalice around their neck. And I asked about, you know, what, what, what's that? You've got one, you've got one. And I found out that that was the Unitarian Universalist uh, Association. And having that community of faith where when I walked in with my hackles raised and said, I'm bisexual, they said, oh, cool. Tell us something else interesting about you, right? And, and that I've been accepted and affirmed has been very important and I've found a great deal of support. And, you know, whether, whether it's that or your pagan drum circle or the radical fairies, you know, have, for me, having some place to um, be part of something bigger than myself where I can find, you know, straight people that are, um, open and affirming and, and wanting to learn, that feeds me and keeps me going. You know, I'm living in a retirement community where there's a lot of people with a lot of health problems and there's a lot of denial about talking about death and dying. We don't talk about death and dying here, we just die. But I'm alive and we're alive. A lot of us are alive. People in their hundreds are alive here. And I'm proud of the legacy that I have already um, taken care of by shipping um, almost 50 boxes of my personal papers to Vassar College Women's Studies um, collection and proud of sending a lot of boxes of my sexuality and spirituality books to the first black run um, department on sex human sexuality, which is at Goddard College. So I got rid of my books and my papers and I moved into this tiny place and I miss them. And it feels good to have that legacy turned over. What are you proud of Lonnie and Billy and Robin? Did, yeah. I, I guess I, I'm, I've been told I should write my memoirs and I'm, been too lazy to do it, so I guess that's the response. Uh, no one's kicking me in the butt to just say I should do it. Uh, but I'm a typical Aries in the sense that I, I see that, that there's a gap or hole in, in something, something missing, and I'm known for starting, getting things started, uh, pulling people into whatever needs to be done and then backing away from it. I, I don't, um, I, I never feel a need that I have to be a, a lifetime executive director, a lifetime politician. Um, I, so what I'm proud of is that I have started a lot of good organizations. Some are still going, some have, um, gone by the wayside, but they have done a lot of good things while they, they existed. I've mentored a lot of folks, uh, enough that I should have at least 12 PhDs. <laughs> First time I, in fact, I'm working with someone now on their doctorate. Uh, so I'm, I'm very proud of having stepped into that role for, to help people out uh, on, a, on, you know, on many different levels. Um, I'm always willing to talk to folks. I, I did three interviews today. Um, hopefully they came out okay. Uh, I came out to my barber today. So, you know, <laughs> it, uh, it, the coming out process is, it, is lifelong. It, it, it's right. an ongoing process. You never, it's never done. Um, you know, I mean, uh, but I'm I'm okay about it, you know. And, and I come out in in different ways. Some there are some settings I feel very safe to just say I'm bisexual, and in other settings I'm very cautious, you know. Uh, so um, that's my response of what I'm mm -hmm. proud of. Um, this is and I'm still going. I mean, uh, my energy right now is toward getting number 45 out of there so we have a number 46 <laughs> to 
that's really important to me. Uh, being about, involved now in the disability community here in DC, and that's important to me. Another one of my centers, uh, another core, and I'm involved with Black Lives Matter, which is very, very important to me. So it's keeping me busy and staying connected to friends and reconnecting with them. And I, I feel a little stumped by that. Um, what I feel, a little deep background, I got married as a teenager, grew up, we were different people, I got divorced, and my husband took my kids and raised them the second half. And uh, that's the hardest thing I have ever done in my whole life, including all the bisexual stuff, including coming out as a lesbian. And being an organizer and activist was my passion, my life, my career, my everything from the time I divorced really in 74 all the way through into the 2000s. And then I came to a point, I might even cry, um, where it was time to be with my family, my kids. And um, um, that's what I've done. I'm reconnected with my kids and my family. And it's not like we were alienated from each other at all, but I'm more present with my kids. I'm wiser. I'm uh, the bisexual community, the bisexual plus community, the LGBT community. That was my family. That was my heart and my soul and my passion. And I just worked my way out of that. And I'm uh, feeling really good about connecting with my son who lives with me. And my daughter, who was a bisexual activist in the 90s, uh, is a chiropractor now. And I'm really proud of her. And, and that I'm a grandmother. And it's really wonderful. And once my book is done, I'll be back kicking ass again. But right now, I'm really proud that I that I can, what I contributed and that I could step away and that um, it's important to step away. It's good role modeling. Okay. That's I, it. I guess, I guess, Ilani, by the way, a lot of people are sending you love on the chat. Yeah. Oh. A lot of people. <laughs> Thank just you. Coming, coming. Um, just, I guess, when I think of the things I'm proud of, I guess just knowing that to make a difference in some people's lives, to give people a little yeah. bit of space to exist, to help people find their own power. Um, and I think, Lorraine, you mentioned the archives that you work on. Um, it took me seven years, but Schlesinger Library at Harvard University has um, By Women, which is now called By Women Quarterly, archived. And it's archived in a way that's digital and searchable and open wow. to anyone who wants to look at it. I picked that library in part because they are an open library and anyone can access it. And, but that was, that's a big deal. I think preserving the work that we've done, preserving our history is really important. The other thing I want to say is, I think one thing I learned over time is that in order to understand bisexuality, you can't just hear one story, you need to hear many. All of them. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, instead of writing my own story and telling my own story over and over, what I've taken to doing is trying to create platforms for other people to tell their stories and which is similar to what Lonnie and Lorraine did in By Any Other Name. It's kind of, yeah, it's what you did. I mean, you're, my, you're an inspiration. So I edited this book called Getting By. Voices, get it, by the way. Voices of Bisexuals. <laughs> around. Bisexual people have amazing puns. And so do trans people for that matter. Like we have amazing pun potential. Um, but this is a 42 country anthology. And so like that was for me a huge thing. And then I, co-edited this anthology, Recognize the Voices of Bisexual Men. And if you look in the top row, you will see... Hey, hey Billy! Hey. <laughs> among among uh, 76 <laughs> other men. And like, I think that's an amazing thing too, because by men, I think are particularly erased. They're erased in yeah. a very specific and intense and very challenging way. And so I partnered creatively with um, Dr. Harukati and we co-edited this anthology together and I, it was an amazing, yeah, I'm really happy with it. And then finally, I just want to mention Bi Woman Quarterly, 
<laughs> Good for you, Robin. It Robert. still exists. It still exists, and it's a grassroots publication um, that it features the voices of women and also um, people who identify as non-binary non who are comfortable in our space. And um, anyone of any gender and any sexual orientation is welcome to sign up for a free digital subscription. It's free. It's absolutely free. The way that we support it is I created an Etsy shop called Byproducts. Ha ha ha. puns. And like, just, but like, I'm really proud of, of these platforms because Bio Women Quarterly, you know, it's been around for almost 40 years and it continues and it has featured so many voices and so many of the people who wrote for us for the first time are now out there mm -hmm. kicking butt in the world and they're doing amazing work. And some of them are like writing books and creating stuff. And yeah, and I, Lonnie and Lorraine have both been in recently actually in, in the Bio, in Bio Women Quarterly. But I think that for me, that's a really important thing just to create that space and invite people to share their stories. Mm -hmm. mm, amen. I think that's a great note for us to wrap up on. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to just, I know I've been the, the tran behind the curtain for this, but I just want to, as a millennial who um, was terrified to come out as bisexual when I was a teenager, um, I just want to thank you all so much for making the world a little easier and a little kinder for um, for the folks who are realizing that about themselves. Um, and this has been such a tremendous panel to be a fly on the wall for. So thank you all so much. Um, I am going to uh, put the info in the uh, chat for how folks can um, keep in touch with Outwards. Uh, so that's got our website, our Instagram, our Twitter, our Facebook. Um, panelists, please feel free to drop uh, your own websites and handles and how people can keep up with you in the chat as well. Um, and just thank you all so much uh, for this beautiful conversation. Um, it's just such a joy. Thank you for your work on doing yes, this. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for putting this together, yes. Such a pleasure, and I, I, feeling the history and the richness of of your you all's uh, relationships with each other. It's just thank you for letting us in on that and letting us witness that. Thanks to uh, thanks to Mason too. Yes, thank you, Mason. He's hopped off video, but thank you, Mason, for uh, for outwards being. Um, and thank you, Lorraine, too. Thank you, Lorraine, for moderating the heck out of this. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, I am. I'm going to click the big red button that says end, even though I don't want to. Okay. Bye. 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 Here's a here's a fun thing that um, some online spaces I've been in have. Been doing it's a little cheesy but i feel like it's appropriate here it's fairy <laughs> dust you we all like blow fairy dust and as we blow the fairy dust the webinar goes away so like <laughs> okay. keep up the fairy dust and on the count of three we're all going to blow it and the webinar will end okay, okay. one two three